I always felt safe, you know, in 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 the embrace of a character or being somebody else felt much safer to me in, than 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 being myself. And also having it was like having a recipe for life being an actor. It was, you know, you had lines, you could inhabit things, you could play, you could experience strong emotion, you could sort of understand the world better, understand other people better, share with other humans what it feels like to be human. It seemed like the the best job in the world, but also the only job that I could do. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rosamund Pike. Thanks. So nice. Thank you. Thanks. So, I mean, Rosamund, it really is true. I mean, just in the last five years, uh, or six years since I was a Telluride and I saw Hostiles and just, you know, then the Private War and the Radioactive, I care a lot. You just keep topping yourself. But whoa is what I said when I was a Telluride again and I saw Saltburn. Saltburn, an amazing, amazing film. Uh, what was the first time you read the script and you, what went through your mind when you read the character of Elspeth? I mean, I'd seen Promising Young Woman, so I probably, like everybody else in the world, I was very, very interested to see what Emerald would do next. Um, and, you know, the, the script I read is still not quite the film that's on the screen because Emerald is someone who keeps writing. And as she sees the dynamics between people, she keeps kind of pushing those things a bit further. And I think there are also, I don't know how many of you have seen Saltburn, but there are definitely scenes in the film which probably could never have been in the script or she would never have got it made. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So the script I read was already ambitious and daring, um, but it definitely got even more so. And I just saw Elspeth Catton as, you know, a a fun ride. Um, She was, she had great lines, that was clear. She has great (laughs) lines indeed. But see, that's interesting that the version you read and you're like, how how far into like reading a script like Saltburn do you start to think about your own performance? Or do you wait till you talk to the director or wait for something else? I don't think the performance really exists until you've met all the other actors. For, for me, I think I think my Elspeth is in relation to this ex, ex, this ensemble that we had that, that Emerald assembled. Um, you know, you have some ideas, but it's, you know, I think 60 or 70% of acting is responding and listening. So therefore, you, you, it doesn't happen until you're with everybody else. Um, and, you know, I'm Elspeth in relation to Richard E. Grant as my husband or Jacob Elordi as my son or, you know, or Barry Keoghan as, as our, our house guest. House guest <laughs> is a word and a half for it, Rosamund. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting you talk about how you know, you kind of wait till you sort of get the read from the other performers, the other, your fellow cast members. And, you know, I'm wondering how, when you, when it came to like maybe, you know, meeting Barry and Jacob and, you know, Richard E. Grant, who plays your husband in the film, who's also fantastic. Like, how did that elevate your performance from what you thought when you read the screenplay? I mean, I think... You know, Elspeth is is more funny out, out loud than she is on the page because it's the fact of what she's doing that's that is so funny. It's the way she is so vain and so shallow. Um and the way she sees herself as a sort of benevolent goddess casting her gaze generously on the unsuspecting. Um and I think she honestly believes she's a kindly person, you know, and, and is kind, very, very kind until you don't interest her anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so it was sort of looking at Barry and saying, you know, tell me about your mother. You know, God, is she still drinking? You know, just feasting, just wanting to draw out. And that's what Emerald's so clever at. She, you know, not many people would dare to look at that particular brand of kind of vampiric um kind of tragedy sucking from someone, you know, the, the need for somebody less fortunate to be in her orbit so she doesn't have to focus on any of the problems going on with her own family. 
It was very interesting to play a mother who's almost entirely unresponsive to her own children. You when know. it came to to working with Emerald Fennell, like I said, you said this is her second film after Promising Young Woman. She won the Academy Award for original screenplay. Uh, what makes her a great actor's director? Oh my God! The, I mean, the trust based set that we had was just phenomenal. She she makes an environment where everybody feels safe to play. She she sort of says it. You know, we're all figuring this out together. You know. It's not sort of leader and follower, although we would have followed her to the ends of the earth because we think she's amazing. Um, but it's just the trust that means that, you know, you can try and fail and, you know, decide something together is not good. You know, she's not saying she has all the answers and she's not expecting us to have all the answers, but she's expecting us to come with the appetite to play. She says right at the outset, you know, there's not going to be any of this kind of star trailer business. You know, we're going to be, everybody's going to, you know, be in the same three ways or two ways and... We're just going to hang out in the green room between takes. Nobody's going to disappear. If there are costume changes, they happen on set. And and actually, it, it's very clever because it's in the green room being together. Because, you know, there's a temptation. You know, you've been on sets. You you you, you know you have 50 minutes, and it's tempting to kind of go and, answer, go and have a look at that post you brought with you or the, you know, check a few emails or, you know, make that phone call to the, I don't know, the dentist that you need to make an appointment with. But if you're made, you're not going to do that in a green room full of everybody else, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So it forces you to just be together. And, of course, games come up and stories come up and then, you know, sometimes sort of intimacy is born and we became so close as a result of that. So it was very much like a company, like a kind of you know, very, the best theatrical experience. In terms she of, insists on that. you know, sometimes actors don't have, there's no time to rehearse because a film may be like a low, real low budget film and you got, you know, 20 days to shoot. In the case of Saltburn, how much prep and rehearsal did you have? How, how, what came out of that rehearsal that wasn't on the script, that wasn't on even after the conversations you had with Emerald? Um, well, Saltburn, we didn't have masses of rehearsal, actually. We, we, we had enough time, we had a read through, which is, was very important for a film like this to see you know, what, what your part contributes to the whole. Um, and then we were in the house all the time. This family in, in the UK who've never opened their house to the public or to a film crew let us film in their house, which was a gift. So you know, the crew moved in, our catering tables were, and catering trucks were outside permanently. You know, our huge cranes were in their garden. Um, and their garden was big, they had enough room for them. But, um, you know, we we were just there. So, you know, everybody ate together. And, and, and so it was growing and developing through kind of games of ping pong and, you know, basketball and, and just sort of fooling around in the in the grounds that that was as much of a rehearsal as, as all the sort of serious proper rehearsal we did. Um, but she's just such a, you know, collaborator. Uh, yeah, it wasn't that was there was the, there was nothing really to do apart from build a sense of family. And although it's a film that some people have found curiously loveless, I think Emerald was very interested in why these people do love each other and what their peculiar brand of love looks like. So it was very important that we, as a cast, you know, grew very affectionate with one another. It's just that this is a type of love that you know not everybody understands, um, and it's a cold love. But it's still love. It's still there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the every what I love about the film, among other things, is is how fully realized every character is written, no matter how much or how little screen time there is, every character is oh fully gosh, realized. Yeah, yeah. So so when you have scenes like like the breakfast scene where the whole cast is together, including like Richard Grant, uh, what were those scenes? What were those days like when you had the whole cast together? I mean, it, it, it's, it, was a, it was a dream because the, you know, the Emerald has written a script here where everybody's relation to everybody else checks out. And I think she'd conceived of this almost as a novel. I think these characters have been in her head for eight years or more. So she really knew them. Um, we, you know, those dinner scenes, you know, you've been in dinner scenes, they're, they're complex to shoot because you have to cover the whole table, you have to go, and so it's a day, you know, that you're sitting around this table eating your boiled egg or whatever it is, um, or your shepherd's pie in the case of the later scene. And it, it you know, the, the, the breakfast scene is light, the, the lunch scene that follows later is devastating. Um, 
and was horrific and traumatic to shoot. And the, and the way that Lena Sandgren sh uh, shot it, you know, we were plunged as curtains. If we, it's very difficult for people who haven't seen this scene, but there's a scene where, you know, something awful has happened. The family is still drawn together over a lunch. And at a certain point, something that we just can't look at passes the window and the curtains are drawn, which are red curtains and plunges the entire scene into a red light. And so day, you know, the whole day doing this where you're in daylight and then everybody's in this red and it, it's the red that also symbolizes the complete torment that these people are in. It's very, very theatrical. Um, when I was doing my research for this conversation, that meant rewatching a lot of your films. And let me tell you, Rosman, that was an awesome movie marathon. Okay. <laughs> and I came to, and I'm going to get to this again in a little bit in the conversation, but when I came to an education, which came out in 2009, the character you played in that film, Helen, you know, she's a, she's a socialite. You know, she's definitely, you know, there's a, there's a class structure in that film. Um, was there any way that maybe you thought about an education and the character of Helen when you were thinking about Elspeth and Saltburn? I loved an education, which was a film in, when did we make it, 2006 or seven? With, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, with Carey Mulligan, and it's a it's based on a Lynn, a, a journalist's sort of short memoir of her time having an affair with an older man. Um, and it was written by Nick Hornby, and that's where a sort of oh. lifelong friendship and collaboration grew for me with with that writer. Um, my character there is is very beautiful and very dim and funny for for that um and lynn who wrote the memoir remembers this girl who she used to hang around with at oxford who was sort of so enigmatic and kind of tantalizingly lovely who was always silent and so glamorous because she was silent and then one day she heard her speak and realized why she was silent it was a very clever ploy because she knew that as soon as she opened her mouth she lost the room she lost anything that she'd created and so that was my character was helen because she and 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 she was very funny because of that, because of her misunderstanding and, you know, vanity and sort of stupidity, really. <laughs> um, and I think when my agent sent me Saltburn, they said he said, "I wonder if you might feel that this is that this is Helen all grown up, oh. this character." There you go. Um, there you go all grown up. That makes a whole lot more sense now. Yeah. yeah. So what what made you? What to become an actor in the first place? I don't, I think, I think it's what you're called to, not, not in some sort of great lofty sense. I just think it's what you are in your core. I think it's the, the, the way that life makes sense. I don't think I had another choice. I think it's just what I was. You know, I was a weird little kid looking in and observing people and wondering why I believed things some people said and didn't believe things other people said and why I was fascinated by delivery and w the way people express themselves and I would imitate them or in my, you know, in private imitate them. And um, and I think I just, I, I, I always felt safe, you know, in, 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 in the embrace of a character I, or being somebody else it felt much safer to me in, than, than, than being myself. And also having, it was like having a recipe for life, being an actor. It was, you know, you had lines, you could inhabit things, you could play, you could experience strong emotion. You could sort of understand the world better, understand other people better, share with other humans what it feels like to be human. It seemed like the, the best job in the world, but also the only job that I could do. Glad well, you did that job. <laughs> so, well, thank you. Um, um, in, in terms of observing, whether whether actors, movies you observed that helped you made you you know you watch it go yeah I really like inspired you that movies that or performances or actors that inspired you when you were really starting to take this seriously. Yeah, I mean everyone from Glenda Jackson in A Touch of Class to Daniel Day Lewis in The Name of the Father, Emma Thompson in Sense and Sensibility, um, you know people who just had you know, the ability to make you f feel and see things 
and you just would watch, you know, the uh, Anthony Hopkins and Rains of the Day and Emma Thompson in that film, you know, the people who you just watch and you can understand such depth, you know. Um, yeah, and, and the people who just move you to, to tears because I think, you know, you, I go to the theatre to be made to laugh or be moved or I want to feel. I don't. I feel like life is about feeling and, and one of the reasons that my character in Saltburn was such a strange one to play was because she's terrified of feeling and she she's so frightened of any real emotion that she either uses sort of social chit-chat to kind of smother emotion in herself and others or she she just immediately buries it, suppresses it. And it was a very odd space for me to live in playing, playing her. Well, what about Romeo and Juliet? How did that play really kind of change the game for you when you realized that someone else saw in you maybe something you didn't see in yourself? I was, I was in something called the National Youth Theatre, which was, you know, I was telling my sons the other day you know, because he was saying that he couldn't, he missed the sign up for a basketball tryout. And I said, well, you have to look at the notice boards in school. When you're in school, you have to look at the notice boards because people stick flyers up and notices and you'll find stuff on those notices. That's how I saw this notice one day in school for this thing called the National Youth Theatre. And it was just there, you know, flapping. And I thought, oh, what's that? And I had to, and it said, you know, we are auditioning for this year's company. And there was an address and I wrote off to that address and and the letter came back saying, you know, you could choose where you wanted to audition. You could do it in London or Bristol or Manchester or whatever. So I did that. And and then I got in and that was, you, 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 I did a, a course one year. And then the next year I did a play. And the third year I was, I didn't get into the company, uh, which is very sad. Um, and I started an office job. And while I was doing the office job, I got a call one day and it was the someone from the National Youth Theatre saying that Kate Winslet's little sister had been cast as Juliet in Romeo and Juliet and then she'd got a television role and so she wasn't going to do it and they wondered if I would play Juliet <laughs> and so having gone from nothing to playing Juliet um, was the probably to this day the most exciting call of my life actually yeah. um, and I've never been frightened of being the substitute I've never been vain about being the second choice you know, because I think you can have an, you know, it, who cares if someone else was the first choice, if it, if you make it yours afterwards. Well, you made it yours and, and someone saw you and noticed you. My agent came, yeah, which I wasn't expecting. I was just about to go to university. And um, and I, I probably because it had originally, they probably thought they were coming to see Kate Winsett's little sister. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, wow. So, you know, I lucked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, so speaking of university, that would be Oxford University, uh -huh. and you were acting there, but I think you also directed? No, I didn't. You didn't direct. I did not. But you, but you were acting at, at Oxford. I was, yeah. And then what was the first time you were actually on a television set? Not, not a TV um, set, but a set. <laughs> I, I, I was probably, it was probably in my first year, I got a, three lines in a film with Albert Finney and Tom Courtney called A Rather English Marriage, T little t and Joanna Lumley, and I played Albert Finney's niece, and I had three lines. Well, I remember <laughs> what I remember, Rosamond. You did not see that in your I did not <laughs> see that, but what I did see yeah. in 2002 was Die Another Day. Die Another Day which is a James Bond movie, Pierce Brosnan's fourth time as Bond, final time as Bond. And this is your first movie, Rosamond. It is a big, big movie, lavish sets, incredible production values. You are, you're, you're not just playing a Bond girl, you're playing MI6. Well, actually you're a double agent. And it is a, sorry, spoiler alert. And then there's a, a lot of physical stunt and fighting. I mean, this is your first movie movie how, first how did you get what it i was doing i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> um how did i get it i was talking about this last night I, w I went you know when you go into a room and you suddenly see a lot of people who look like you well i went into a room i'd just been back i'd finished university i was backpacking i came back there was this audition for a bond film i'd never seen a bond film um <laughs> which is unusual i realize and i went into this still in my kind of shaggy haired look you know, from being from traveling a kind of long skirt and a cardigan. And there were all these women in what would be far more appropriate 
get up for a Bond girl, and I thought, oh dear, I've got this very wrong. <laughs> this is definitely. Um, anyway, I did this, did the scene, and um, and then it was uh, I was called to go to Eon House, which is the home of Barbara Broccoli's production company, and on right by Hyde Park, big mansion house on Piccadilly. And I went from the place where the casting director was there to meet Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson and Lee Tomahori, who was directing. And and I read for them and um, I did the, did the reading and I was going down this big spiral staircase and this voice called from above, don't go anywhere. And I looked up and it was Lee and he said, I think you need to come to Pinewood for an audition. And... Um, I said, well, that's great. It felt like being, it felt like having won a competition to be, pretend to be a Bond girl for a day. Because I was picked up. Well, first I had to, oh my God, first I was, uh, I was rung up and asked if I had a suit I could wear for the audition. And I said, I do not have a suit. <laughs> um, so I went shopping the night before with the costume designer's assistant, who was Jacqueline Duran, who has now won three Oscars um, for, for, you know, she did Pride and Prejudice after that. And then she won an Oscar for Little Women and for... Anna Karenina probably and anyway but it was me and Jacqueline Duran in Selfridges this big department store and we also had to pick underwear because there was this thing when when there was going to be a scene where a dress was dropped and I had to reveal underwear and we picked a suit we picked the underwear and she said you know she had some dresses and if I wanted to bring a dress that I had at home I could bring it and my mother was a classical singer and she had a lot of lovely dresses as in my mind you know these big sort of 80s, 90s costume, you know, large dresses that she wore for concerts. And I thought there was no more beautiful dress than these because I thought she looked wonderful in them. So I, we looked at one of these dresses. I was still living with my parents. I looked at one of these um, dresses and it was kind of really 80s. It was sort of silk taffeta and it had these big roses on it. And we thought maybe the roses were a bit much. So we took those off, we stitched, we took those off. And I arrived with this huge dress bag the next day and Jacqueline was there and Lindy Hemming, the designer, and they looked at this and they looked at each other and I knew something was wrong. They said, well, that is a very, very beautiful dress. But Bond girls tend to wear something more like this. And they held up what to me looked like three pieces of string. Um, <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, oh, okay, okay. But then I did have one moment because I was supposed to, in that audition, drop the dress and I didn't do it. And I thought, I'm not gonna do that. And if they want to see me in my underwear, they can, they can see that when I do the role, if I do the role. So I don't know what possessed me to kind of say no, wow. or not say no verbally, but just not do it. Right, right, right. But, but maybe that was what got me the job, who knows? Well, that movie, you know, it. when I was rewatching it, I just thought, you know, there's a lot of range. Even though it is a quintessential James Bond movie, there is a lot of range to Miranda Frost. You don't, like, you know. She's being so nice, Scott, it really is not my best performance. I, 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 but, but this is your first movie. I know, it was so intimidating. I mean, my goodness, the times I've thought I would love to do that again and have a shot at it now. Now I could kill Miranda Frost. Now I could really play her. But the, you know. the physical demands too, because you had to fight Halle Berry at the end of the film. Yes, I mean, Halle was just coming off her Oscar. Can you imagine how intimidating this was? I was 20 to 21. Um, you know, Pierce was 50 maybe? Halle was sort of so glamorous and out of reach. And I was dressed up to look like I was 30. So nobody gave me any credit for actually being the age I was. Um, Gosh, it was so intimidating. And the stages, my, I mean, it was incredible. The, you know, the 007 stage at Pinewood where they built the Ice Palace, yeah. you know, a structure with the engineering required to actually have a car chase inside a, a set on a stage. Um, I mean, it was just extraordinary. And, this, and, the, and then we had the, 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 a set, another set that had a whole, uh, like it was made to, based on the Eden Project, which is a big sort of hot house, um, you know, um, indoor kind of plant. What's the word I'm looking for? Like greenhouse, sort of large green, but sort of tropical greenhouse. And we had a stage that was that as well. But that for for a trial by fire as an yeah. actor, you must have just like taken a lot from that film. I had fencing training with the the, the ex trainer of the British Olympic fencing team, and 
I mean, I put my heart and soul into it, but I wish, you know, now I always remember when I'm with young actors now, for instance, during the Wheel of Time, and they're 22 and they seem so self-possessed. I always know, remind myself of how I felt and make sure that I check in and see how they're doing and let them know that they can come to me for any with any thoughts at all because I wished there was somebody like that for me then. But when you when you came off of Die Another Day, you know, this big film, you really you know, took a step back in terms of like the production design, the, the, the scope of the movies themselves. And you won a supporting actress award from the British Independent Film uh, Society for The Libertine. So like, what was it like to go from Die Another Day to something way scaled back? Well, the first thing I did was a play at the Royal Court, which was a tiny independent theater in London for new writing. Um, and I did a play called Hitchcock Blonde, which was about Hitchcock's... Uh, you know, fa fascination with, with blondes and with the way that he would have particular kind of psychosexual control over his actresses and also other women that he filmed in rehears the rehearsal process. And this was a play about somebody who it was imagined had been Janet Lee's body double in Psycho because yeah. it was understood that Janet Lee herself did not do any of the close-ups of the, of the body in the shower. Um, so we imagined, or Terry Johnson, the playwright, imagined that a girl had been plucked out of the typing pool and asked to do this. And it was about her relationship with Hitchcock. And I did that. That was the first thing I did. And I remember being on the bus going over the bridge in London to Clapham where we had our rehearsal rooms. And I'd just been flown around the world first class, you know, in kind of, you know, MGM studios at their height. You know, hotel rooms, red carpets, pierce, you know, the whole thing. And I remember being on the bus and thinking, oh... I can exhale and this is this is who I am. <laughs> I was like, you know, what most people would, I, I just felt so much happier <laughs> being back. You know, it was, I mean, I know that probably sounds absurd, but it's the truth. Um, and, and then I did The Libertine, which is a little film with Johnny Depp based on, again on a play um, which John Malkovich produced and John Malkovich had played uh, on stage and Johnny had been passionate about doing it and yeah, I had a, yeah, I did win an award for that. What, what, was, it, what was it like to win an award for, for an acting job? It was very exciting. It was very exciting and I didn't expect it. And I didn't, I mean, I just was so clueless back then. I really felt clueless and out of my depth all the time, if I'm honest. <laughs> you know, it was strange. It's, and I, I maybe, I always look at the young actors now and think, they just are so much more put together than I ever felt. And maybe, but maybe they're not. Maybe they don't feel put together at all. Well, if you were, you, you could have fooled us because you certainly will always look like you know what you were doing. <laughs> uh, you know, there are certain films like when you look back on them and you just go, "Wow, what a what a great cast in like School Ties or or Dazed and Confused or Pride and Prejudice, two thousand five, directed by Joe Wright." Rosamund Pike, Kira Knightley, uh, uh, Carrie Mulligan for the first three Jenna times. <laughs> what was that? I mean, that how did that sort of help get you clued in? That was like that was the pro that was the first film where I felt okay. This is I'm with a group of people I really trust. You know, it, it, you know, and it, and it was it was it was the, it showed me that filmmaking could be could give give you the same experience as being in the theater. You could rehearse. You could feel safe. You could trust who you were working with. You had space to play. You could believe fully in the world. You, you, you know. I felt free. It was the first time I felt really free. What? Okay, let's and that's talk credit about. to Joe and to the just the atmosphere he creates on his sets and the story. I think the story of Pride and Prejudice has magic in it. Well, you 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 revisited the Pride of Pride and Prejudice when you did a an uh, you know recorded an audio. I did. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. what is it about about that that you know, when in 2005 or when you did the audio, uh, that that story holds up to even today, 2023. Well, because Jane Austen is funny and, and so clever at observing, you know, she's very witty and ironic and, you know, she's, she's, she's merciless at looking at people's vanities and foibles. Um, but also it's about young people feeling big feelings for the first time and falling yeah. in love and understanding that and siblings and... Um, 
you know, it's a proper it's a proper romance with obstacles to that romance, which is the recipe of any good love story. So I want to go back to an education because I'm curious, was that the first time you worked with a director who was a woman? You tell me, was it? I think it was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a little sure thing, yes. Um, gosh, right, yes, must have been. It never, it didn't seem to me to be much so different because, you know, if you, Joe Wright is a very, um, I don't know, understanding and caring kind of director. So it, it, that's what you're really, you're looking for the feminine energy in a director often. Sure. It doesn't have to always be from a woman that the feminine energy comes, if you know what I mean. Um, but Lona Scherfig was, yeah, she was, she was great fun and great, again, gave us freedom. And I think because we were all of, a, of the same age and Carrie and I knew each other already. So that was easy and fun. And Dominic Cooper is, is a, is great and fun as well. Um, so it was, again, felt free. With that film, with an education, you know, again, I, I've been watching your movies now for about seven years or so. And I felt like, okay, it's, an, it's a supporting role. It's a smaller role. But then I, I read at the time uh, that, that was you were, you were looking to do the supporting role because it gave you a chance to stretch then in a role that you hadn't done before. Was that the case? Because it was a yeah, little more- Yeah, she was funny. And, she was and, funny. She was, and my agent sort of said, why do you want to do this? I said, I think I can do something with this. You know, I have to, nowadays, not at the beginning, because at the beginning it's all a myth that you know, actors make choices. You don't, you just take whatever you're offered. Um, <laughs> I remember being sort of flattered by nice interviewers like yourself asking me about my choices and <laughs> thinking, I don't think I'm really making any choices. I think I'm just saying yes. <laughs> and now I've, you know, now choices have come from saying no. But um, um, but yeah, I, I felt I could do something with the role in, in an education. It was, it was just a chance to, it's about reacting. I, I just one of the greatest teachers was on a, a television job I did called Love in a Cold Climate, where an actress called Sheila Gish, who sadly died, I said, "Oh, I haven't got any lines today." She said, "Oh, that's wonderful, darling." She said, "That's the best kind of scene." <laughs> she said, "When you just really have to listen," and I thought, "Oh," she said, "Just really listen, and you'll find it the most enjoyable scene you'll ever do." And um, I did, and I've never really looked back after wow. that. But but you know, in terms of the way the way the way the business saw you, and the way the way you saw yourself by that point. So you know, you've been at it now for you know eight years or so, and, and professionally speaking, did you start to gain more confidence so that you could sort of break out and not be pigeonholed, so that you could do you know more funny roles like in Johnny English Reborn? I don't think I gained. I don't think I got real confidence until after Gone Girl because I think. I think, you know, we, we'll probably come on to that, but I think David Fincher gave me more education and teaching and experience in front of a camera than I'd had in the entire 15 years prior to making that film, probably. But, but you know, but the thing is, that was an interesting thing, Johnny English, because I'd been funny in an education because I'd had great lines. And then Rowan Atkinson had seen it and loved it and so wanted me to join him in Johnny English. But it was impossible to be funny in Johnny English because he's the funny one. And, you know, he doesn't really want anyone else to be funny. Um, and I didn't have any funny lines. So that was a sort of lesson in, it's very, it's very hard because, you know, you, I'm not funny. It's just that the character can be funny. Right. The character is either funny or not funny. And the character in Johnny English, my character was not funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a funny one. Um, it's uh, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, sure. um, you were playing like but, a but but person. so many comedians came out to me after that. Um, even even Edgar Wright when I did The World's End, um, which is a film I love and has just had its fifteenth, tenth anniversary or something. I've just missed being. Yeah. The boys have all just been together in London. I'm quite yeah. jealous because that I did. I was able to be funny in that. Um, well, well, you but know, an education sort of prompted people to see me as potentially comic. Well, that, that was the first of, of a few game-changing roles for you. But also, you know, you were also doing like big, like the Hollywood-type movies, like Wrath of the Titans and Doom 
and like what were so, what were sort of the challenges in in going back to that kind of like big huge scale production i think there was always the feeling in england that if you could be in one of those big hollywood movies you'd have a chance of getting independent material funded and financed back in the uk that was the sort of wisdom of agents back then that if you could do something that was sort of box office success um it would mean that you could get things made. Um, so there was encouragement to sort of pursue those things. I don't actually know if it's true. <laughs> um, um, but yes, I mean, I, and I was, I was often paired with, because of the Bond film, I think I was often paired with male co-stars who were, who were much older than me. I also did a film with Bruce Willis and I did a film, well, with Johnny, he's not, he wasn't so much older, but he was older. Um, Paul Giamatti, um, Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, yeah, Jack Reacher, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the line so, I, that sticks out to me for Jack Reacher is, "Would you please put your shirt on?" <laughs> <laughs> she was funny. <laughs> okay, yeah. What's it yeah. like making? Well, I mean, Chris McQuarrie, who is you know, he's directed like the last fifteen Mission Impossible movies. Um, just the last three. Uh, but what's like working with Tom Cruise? Like, I mean, obviously there's there's an actor who has been at it and knows how to play the game and do his thing. Like, what were some of the acting? Tom's totally amazing. I mean, he's a complete force of nature. And I was really looking at all of his films before thinking, you know, what is it? When does he have, you know, chemistry with his co-star and what are the sort of you know because i wanted to you know try and create a male female dynamic that would have the chemistry you know that they'd had in risky business or in top gun or um you know even though ours was not it wasn't a a sort of love story but it you know you can still have great chemistry even if there's not a love story um it was slightly interfered with by the fact that i fell pregnant on that film and i think that was um, or found out i was pregnant um and I have to say that was absolute credit to Tom and Chris, who, you know, was stood by me 100%, didn't mind that I was, you know, changing shape or, you know, they they were just totally supportive. Tom, I mean, Tom went above and beyond as he always does and, you know, got me a nutritionist and I think I probably had one of the healthiest pregnancies thanks to the support I received from Tom, actually, in terms of, you know, making sure I was, you know, all up to date with my vitamins and things. Um, but, but they are, you know, he, he's, he's a machine. He, he doesn't seem to sleep. He, he's, he's amazing. He's, he's, you know, does all his own stunts as we know. And it's, yeah. but to be, have a f first hand ringside seat for that is, you know, I would get up in the middle of the night just to go and watch the filming of the car chases because, you know, you thought I'm never going to get a chance to see this again. There aren't going to be many actors who are going to do this to the level he does it. That's for sure. I mean, anyone watching the last, you know, it's five yeah. missions, yeah. But it's, Rosman, I want to ask, what a game changer in 2014, Gone Girl. What a game changer. I mean, how did you get that role? Um. I I I had a message that David Fincher wanted to meet me over Skype, as it was then. Um, and during the conversation with him, he asked if I'd read this book, Gone Girl. And I hadn't. And he said, oh, that's great. He said, that's great that you haven't. He said, I want you to read it and I want you to call me after each section or each chapter or something. Wow. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, and I'd thought it was a general meeting, but then I realized that, you know, David doesn't do anything that's general. He just, he hones in incredibly specifically. And then, you know, as I got through the book and we carried on talking, I, I, I asked him, I said, well, it's, I said, I, I realize you're seriously considering me for this part. I said, which is very exciting because I know I've got this part in me. But how the hell do you know it? Because there's nothing of my work to date. If you'd seen me on stage, maybe. But there's nothing of my work on film that shows you anything about what you need for Amy. But I have got it in me. But how do you know it? Well, how did you know it? How, what was it in you that you said, I've got this. I can do this. I'll crush it. 
I just had a secret about it. I just knew, I just knew, I could do that complexity of turning, of turning, of all her, you know, the fact that she's acting all the time, Amy, and the fact that she's, you know, she's. I just sort of understood her, I suppose, the, you know, the the thing that's propelled her to be the person she is, the, the you know, the only child who's had the, the fictional sibling. Her parents are these children's book writers who have written a kind of idealized version of her childhood and put her on, put her into these books as a sort of idealized version of herself, which has probably given her great rage and um, low self-esteem and and that sort of makes her this sort of type A personality she is. And I'd I'd also done I'd also researched for a film that didn't happen a, a, a sociopathic character. And I thought, oh, well, see, life makes sense. You do all the research, and this is why I did that is because it would pay off, and I would be able to talk to David Fincher. I, so I had it all sort of simmering away inside me, thoughts about sociopathy and narcissism and all of these things. And then finally, I mean, who, what better a mind to share it with than Finch's, who's so exacting, so, I mean, he just feeds you daily with just, you know, stuff to fuel your imagination. Um, but then he made me, he put me through a lot of paces. I had to fly to St. Louis to meet him for one night. And I was in the middle of a film and I had to lie. I had to pretend that I was staying in Glasgow and I had to get a flight to St. Louis and back. Um, and then cook up a story as to why I was late to set on Monday, you know, without anyone having any idea that I'd just been with David Fincher in a, you know, meeting late night in the hotel in St. Louis talking about Gone Girl. And on the way, oh my God, on the way to St. Louis, I still hadn't seen, I got this email from him. It was like, David Fincher, for your eyes only. And I was like, the chills, and there was the script. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God, oh my God. I mean, it was, yeah. And then there was still more on the way back from, uh, once I got back, there were still more meetings. And then there was a big Zoom. That was when I discovered Zoom. He did this big read through oh, yeah. with all the people he was considering. And he got us all on a big Zoom meeting and read the script. And Ben was there and um, pretty much everybody, apart from a couple of people who, he who, who didn't end up doing it. Well, you read that script. And you really honed in on Amy. I mean, like, this is like an actor's dream. That's an actor's dream. Like, did you just, like, look at that and just go, oh, I'm going to have fun with this one? Yeah, but it was also terrifying. I mean, it was more scared on that job and more days coming home to my partner and saying, I've got to give up after this. I'm never going to be good enough to, to, to fulfill what he's asking. And I can see what he wants, but it's out of reach. And... You know, you feel like you just can never hit all the multitude of notes that Amy has in her. Um, no, it was really hard, but really, really fun, really fun. And then on other days, I'd say I get to do everything in this. I get to be every every dimension of being a woman in this part, everything. So so if you were, were wondering, you know, having like doubts about, my God, how can I reach this? Like, how did you reach it? Like, when, like what were those moments where you said, I've reached it, I got it? I never think that. I've never no. thought that in my life. <laughs> never, never. And David doesn't give you any. I mean, I, twice during filming, he went. That was the most of a kind of. And that was the only thing that sort of. I clung to those two things for six months. Six months. The, I had no. I thought he thought I was shit. I thought he thought, what, you know, why have I cast this girl? I honestly had no idea whether he just thought he'd made the biggest mistake of his life, apart from twice those two things. I thought, well, two scenes will be all right. Were, were there, <laughs> was he like a kind of director who did like a whole bunch of takes or? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. he was. But that's what I mean. I got more screen time, more practice. Sure. It was like, I was like, my God, I need so much practice. You know, it was like the first thing when you become an actress in Bond film, you know, I, uh, Two hours in hair and makeup. I was like, my God, I need two hours to look acceptable. <laughs> I was like, oh, my, well, how am I ever going to go out in public ever again? <laughs> <laughs> you are funny. <laughs> so, so, listen, Oscar nomination morning. You heard your name. 
Uh, what was I that didn't like? hear my name. I was in bed with a baby. I had a new baby. Somebody called I missed you. it. Like I've missed every important event of my life, including the call to say that I'd got the Bond film. I had had an unfortunate breakup with a boyfriend had stormed off to somewhere where I could be out of reach. And I missed the call. No one could get hold of me to say I'd got the Bond film. I was asleep when I got the Oscar nomination. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, yeah. And then, and then I'd say, I, I was in LA and it seemed to be a clear morning and and my fellow likes playing tennis and i'd said to him you know this is a morning where nothing's going on you should go off and play tennis so i had a newborn baby and a two-year-old and then i got nominated for an oscar and when you're nominated for an oscar everybody wants to talk to you so i had a sort of morning of phone calls and i had these two kids that i including a baby so i was i i mean it was I, and then, the, oh my God, there was this, I've suddenly remembered this. So I was letting my older son drive cars up sort of my body as a sort of racetrack, hoping that the, hoping that the interviewer from Variety or whatever wouldn't hear. And then he was going, <laughs> I think, right. And then I heard, he got my hair and I heard the unmistakable sound of my hair being caught in the mechanism of a, you know, one of those pullback cars. Oh. And I was carrying on talking to Variety, hearing this <laughs> And afterwards, this car was not leaving my head. It was attached, a kind of oh, blue, geez. sort of blue car about this big, kind of hanging off the side of my head. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's, yeah, there you go. Truth, reality. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, sure. Had to cut it out. <laughs> uh, Hole in the well, yeah. How did you alopecia. get that out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so after after Gone Girl, what do you felt like that was a point where, you know, maybe I don't have to keep auditioning? Like what's what was the point where you had to audition less it's and less? It's such a nice thing to audition though, you see, because by the time you've it, you know, you have auditioned, you know that on day one everybody is behind your casting. You know, people know you can do it. They know you're you know, you know you're on the same page with the director, they've seen what you can do. I think it's sort of, there's a kind of level of embarrassment where you're not asked to audition and they're kind of wondering whether you've got it in you and you're kind of wondering whether you've got it in you. I I'm, I I'm, like, I think auditioning is good. I think, or at least read, offering to read it or, you know, yeah, I, I, I do think it's good. What was the, what was it like after the success of Gone Girl, the Oscar nomination? How did that, really changed the kind of roles that you were getting, scripts that you were getting, the attention you were getting. You know, I, I want Rosamund Pike for this. Uh, get me the Rosamund Pike type for that. I mean, I think some people who didn't understand the complexity of Gone Girl maybe, you know, there were kind of some cheesy, cheap thrillers I was offered, which I didn't want to do. Um, I wanted to kind of, you know, work with filmmakers who interested me I went and did I, a United Kingdom with Ama Asante and David Iyelowo because I that was just one of the most beautiful love stories I'd ever read and I love love stories and it you know it was a wonderful experience um and then you know I I wanted to keep pushing myself and do things that you know Amy pushed me right out of my comfort zone in so many levels and I wanted to continue sort of showing myself as a character actress who could take on lead roles, but, 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 but play proper characters, you know? Well, I, I feel I was going to ask about, about a United Kingdom because that was around the same time that you also did Hostiles mm -hmm. with Scott Cooper, director, writer, director, Scott Cooper, Christian Bale was in the film too. That was another film that I did see at Telluride uh, in 2017. And uh, in terms of toward the force, that applies because your performance is so emotionally gut wrenching, and also filming. I mean, you're definitely filming out in the out in the open like that yeah. uh, with the elements. So how how was that a new experience for you as an actor? Well, Scott Cooper and Christian had seen a music video that I did for Massive Attack, which I don't know if anyone's seen, um, <laughs> and it's a kind of almost like a dance based piece that. I, you know, I became, I became, I've become, as I've got older, very much more interested in, in movement 
because I think in the early part of my career, I, I, d I think I was sort of almost scared of being fully in my body in some way. Um, you know, I don't think I was, I always felt I lacked something in fight sequences and I was sort of determined to break through that. And I think having children and, you know, you, seeing what your body can do as a woman in that, you know, in that dimension really kind of freed me up. And, and I just thought I've just got to kind of express physically from now on in a, in a, as the, as the kind of leading part of my work. So I did this massive attack video and, and then Scott and Christian saw that and felt something about that they wanted for this character, Rosalie Quaid, who, um, and so I thought, well, they've seen that and I must kind of continue to honor that, that they've seen and, and think about this character on, in an entirely physical way. And, and, and the, the sort of driving force of this character is tremendous grief because in the early opening scenes of the film, her, almost her entire family, well, her entire family is murdered. And I have to really do a deep dive into where grief sits, how it, how it feels, you know, wh this character exists almost silently, but with this tremendous agony at her core and where is it and, and how does it come across? And um, there's, a, there's a terrible, terrible scene where she, you know, Christian's character comes as a, with a cavalry and they find the burnt out shell of, of this house and inside they meet this woman who's been sort of there for three days probably with, with her children that she's, she's, she's brought back in from where they've been killed and put them back to bed. And he and these men tenderly take her up to where their camp is and prepare to bury her family and See, it's funny, you see, you start describing it and your body starts to relive it. It's a very odd thing about, um, that's the weird thing when you know that all these characters that have had an impact stay in you. So she says to these guys, she just says, drop those shovels. And she says, I will bury my family. And she goes out onto this plane and, um, and just starts to, to, to dig with her bare hands and it, it was a sort of um, very harrowing thing to shoot and Scott you know he it was very powerful probably because of the way he shot it with the men just watching her just standing um, what was the question <laughs> <laughs> I think you Sorry. answered it in Sorry. terms of like new challenges for you. Sorry, new challenges, yeah. new challenges. Yeah. So, so yes, and and a different sort of American accent, and and also just understanding that the the pioneer mindset, you know, the Western obviously looms yeah. so large in American cinematic history. So there's a there's a sort of imposing pressure of the idea of the Western, I think, as well. Well, if if it wasn't hostiles that that gave you new challenges to go deeper emotionally and physically, it was most certainly the following year, Marie Colvin, A Private War. Wow, wow. I just remember being completely blown away by your perform by the film itself, but particularly by your performance. Um, why was that a movie you almost didn't do? Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a story uh, that I, I did? I did my research. Yeah. <laughs> um, apparently, there was just a, uh, uh, you know, there were people associated with her life that, yeah. Oh yes, um, <laughs> yes. So Ama Asante, who directed a United Kingdom, she told me about this this war correspondent Marie Colvin, who'd written for the Sunday Times. And she said, you read about her. She said, you're nothing like her. You look nothing like her. But she said, when I saw you running across this field in the United Kingdom, I know you can do it. And I know this is in you. And she said, you must seek out this project because they're making a film about her and you must play her. And I was like, oh, okay. And, um, and it was Charlize Theron's company that was developing it. And I think Charlize had probably won, thought she might play it at some point anyway, was not going to any longer. And Matthew Heinemann, the documentary maker who's just having an amazing time with American Symphony, 
um, was going to make it because I think he would have made a documentary about Marie had he been able to. And I read everything I could about her um, and convinced Matt that I could play her. And it was funny because I wrote down this 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 thing about who Marie was, and I I wrote it and sent it to him, and I said, "This is who I believe this woman is." And then after we'd made the film, cutting forward, one day I found on my computer this document about who Marie was, and I was like, I saw this, and I said, "Matt, have you ever seen this before? Who wrote this?" And he said, "You did." I said, "When did I write that?" I said, "What?" What do you mean? I, when did I write it? He said, "You wrote it to me before we made the film." I said, "But how did I? How? Wh I don't. I didn't understand where this thing had come from, right? This, this, because then I obviously got to understand the woman properly. But, but I had had a kind of weird insight into her. Anyway, when we started to make it, her friends didn't um, didn't want it made. They were very frightened of a kind of Hollywoodization of of their friend." They had seen a script, they'd hated the script. It wasn't actually the script we were making, but they were convinced it was. They loathed it. I, I arranged to meet one of her friends for lunch and she said, you know, there's absolutely no part of me that wants this film made. And I said, well, there's nothing, I can't do anything unless I have your support. And they, she said, well, we're never going to give it to you because no one will understand Marie. We don't want a film made about her. You know, there's not not going to be any chance of getting any truth. And I just tell you now that all her friends and family will think the same. And now I'm going to go because this is just too upsetting for me. So I was kind of chilled. And I thought, I said to Matt, I said, what are we going to do? Um, and then there was the editor of British Vogue at the time, um, Alexandra Shulman. And she had been a friend of Marie's. And because I know her a little bit, she agreed to have dinner because I said to her please just meet this director please just see him because you'll see that he's he's not a kind of Hollywood um you know he's not going to glamorize the story he's a documentarian he knows exactly he wants to feel the person he comes in not with any agenda um but he wants to get at truth and Alex really liked Matt and slowly bit by bit convinced Marie's friendship group to trust us and and then we got there and one day I met and I got this, I was still not sure whether I could do it because if, the, if they weren't going to talk to me, I knew I was only going to get, I wasn't going to get at the truth of her. Um, and then one day I got the, this knock at my door and it was a black taxi driver um, with a bag and he said, oh, I just, someone just gave this to me in my cab and told me to drop it off at this address. And I said, oh, thanks. And it was this kind of quite sort of dirty plastic bag. And I opened it and inside there was some clothes. And I thought, well, this is a bit odd. And I opened it up and there was a note from one of her friends saying, These, this was a sweater and a jacket of Marie's. I think you should wear them in the film. And that was the point I thought, okay, we're going to do this. And that was the point that people turned around and and we got the support and started to trust us. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, that's uh, also a very, very physical role. Uh, oh my beyond gosh, just, so physical, yeah. Wow. And all, But also adding to that is uh, you spent half the film wearing an eye patch. How did that present new challenges for you? Yeah, it was the eye patch. It was the, you know, an interview I did recently threw, threw back at me the fact that I'd done this exercise with gaffer tape where I'd gaffer tape my upper arms because of Marie's physicality that meant that her elbows were always quite close to her chest and she had this interesting physicality um, and I'd completely forgotten I'd done this. Again, working with Scarlett Macmin, who's a movement coach that I work with a lot. She's a dancer. Um, and we spent hours in a room just sort of working on Marie's physicality and and, and dancers are particularly good at at engaging the back and actors are really bad at engaging our backs because <laughs> we sort of forget about our backs a lot and she felt that you know anyone who works in a war zone is is particularly aware of their back that sounds a strange detail but perhaps you can imagine what i mean so there was a kind of tension coming out of her back which was very important to the final physicality of this woman um 
as well as the eye patch. You see, and then look, you see, as I start to talk about that, it starts to come. It's so weird. I'm mean, probably you had this yourselves that those characters they they stay in you. They're in you somewhere, you know. Um, um, but yes, it was it was a physical challenge. The eye patch. Her, her age, um, her smoking. I'm a very bad smoker, so I had to do a lot of practice at that. Um, you know, and all the things that you do when you're a rookie smoker, like, you know, you're driving driving your car, smoking out the window, thinking, I've got this. Open the window, flick the ash, and it all blows back in your face. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all those things. Um, but then, good, there was a, then there was the really satisfying thing, because she was a big drinker as well, Marie, and I remember inhaling really deeply, and then taking a, a swig of my vodka and then real I mean fake vodka on set and then realizing that I hadn't exhaled and I thought oh maybe it, maybe it's still in there so and there it came out and I was like okay I really am a smoker now <laughs> I can s inhale drink then exhale you know Rosamond these last five years with each passing film plus you're also doing voiceover work on Thunderbirds or Go I mean you're working uh, working a lot but from one Marie to another, from Marie Colvin to Marie Curie in Radioactive. And now, you know, you're going from more correspondent to a scientist. Uh, what makes science sexy? I don't think, I, it was sadly, we were sad that film didn't get more of a reception. Um, because it was, it was, I, I felt very, very proud to play Marie Curie. She was a difficult, complicated woman who, you know, didn't, and we didn't want to make a film that sort of glamorized her or pandered to, you know, trying to make her sort of very appealing and sweet, you know, because if she was that, she, she'd she be the girl next door, but she wouldn't be Marie Curie, you know. But again, it was another role, yet another role that had to tackle grief. So I had sort of yeah. these roles coming quite hot and fast that involved grief because Marie Curie lost her husband very young. And he was her sort of complete soulmate and partner. So, you know, along with all the brilliance and her science and her kind of uncompromising toughness with herself, her daughter, the people she worked with, she was, she was, she was grieving. Um, and that was a kind of touchstone for the whole film. So I, I needed to leave grief behind after that one. Oh, you did. Yeah, other people were grieving after that one because, you know, to this day, Whenever, you know, because people know that I, I cover movies, I interview filmmakers, I review movies sometimes. People say, what should I see? What's good? To this day, I still say, did you ever see I Care A Lot? It's it's on Netflix. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> You've got to see this movie. You won a Golden Globe for it. Uh, another role, another character, another script that you read when you read the screenplay or first talk with Jay. Yeah, yeah. I that, just said, I've got to play this. Right. And he wanted Emily Blunt. And I waited patiently, patiently, patiently. Because I knew, right, at that scene, at that time, there was a scene in I Care A Lot with a strap-on. And I thought, they're never going to let Mary Poppins do a scene <laughs> with a strap-on. <laughs> and I just bided my time. <laughs> You're like, just a matter of time. Good things come, right? <laughs> I've never minded being the substitute, as I started off by saying. <laughs> so with, with a character like Marla Grayson, yeah. What were your another point <laughs> points of connection? Like, like, how did you, how did what informed your approach? Like, was it uh, maybe other an, uh, other film characters that you saw in movies in the past that, like, you know, oh, I think I think I'll, you know, borrow from that actor. Well, Jay and I just we spent we both live in London, which is very nice. If you live if you're preparing to do a film and you live in the same place as a filmmaker, so I would go around to Jay's apartment and we just watch film after film after film, and we were looking at kind of the unlikable female character trope and working out when they were, f hello, sh oh, hello. <laughs> I've had my backs to you guys. Sorry, my manager and her daughter, hey, hello. <laughs> oh no, that's so nice. I'm rabbiting on telling you all the things you know already. Um, um, the, uh, yeah, we, we, the unlikable female character trope and we just wanted to look at lots of films and and work out what made them fun to watch. You know, there are times when somebody's unlikable and remote and you just don't like them. And then there are the times when they're just awful and totally delicious to watch, like Linda Fiorentina in The Last Seduction, or um, I can't think of the others, or, you know, Nicole Kidman in To Die For. Um, there, there are lots of lots of them. There are lots of um, Joan Crawford things too. Um, 
but we we did that and we we were trying to we that's what our goal was was to make you know something that shone a light on an important issue but make it diabolical and fun and that you just sort of think this woman is awful i can't wait to see what she does next <laughs> wait, okay that's that is <laughs> crucial rosman because like i can't wait to see what this awful person does next how do you know how far to go with the awfulness without losing the audience so they still root for the character oh um I think the, the character's got to be having fun. I think the character's, because I think, you know, you, you sense this stuff on screen. You sense when somebody is, you know, you don't want to, you actually, well, it can be awful as well. If you just think an actor's having much more fun than the audience, that's the worst. <laughs> you often get it in the theater. Uh, <laughs> where, um, but um, yeah, I think it's just about, it's about feeling that they're living their truth in some way. You know, and I think Marla Grace and I, I made a backstory for her that she'd had a vape shop and oh. she'd been kind of Walmarted out of business by a kind of bigger vape shop across the road. And so she just had tried to live the American dream and go clean and sort of have a small business. And someone had screwed her over and she thought, right, I'm going to screw everyone else over. <laughs> right, right, right. And that's when she came up with the idea of you know, duping the elderly. And it's a brilliant thing because it's a, it's a crime thriller where the person, the lead criminal is not actually breaking the law. So it's really just America's broken legal right. system that we have to thank for that allowing people like point. Marla Grayson to exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is an extremely good point. Now it's going to totally change my <laughs> perspective when I watch that movie again, but also the scenes you have with Peter Dinklage. I mean, the battle oh, of between Peter. you two. That must have yeah. been fun film in those scenes. Um, it was so fun working with Peter, um, so fun working with Asa. Um, yeah, Peter, Peter, I just love that man so much. It was, it was just, it, it, they were really joyful, even though he had a plastic bag over my head. And I found out because it was a low budget film that, you know, we were, <laughs> I'm just suddenly remembering this. I had this b plastic bag over my head and and some oxygen and sort of invisible tubes up my nose for this scene where he's got me captured. And we have a, a sort of paramedic with us on set and he says, right, you know, we're down to a eighth of a tank. And I said, oh, okay, so shall we be getting out the next tank? And he's like, well, we've only got one. I was like, who only has one tank of oxygen when the lead actress is in a plastic bag with a plastic bag <laughs> over her head? I was like, hmm. Okay, so we 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 moved on with that pretty quickly. But that was also this. This is if you haven't seen the film, it's also the film where I had to go over the edge of a cliff in a car and and do a drowning scene, escaping from a a car. And that was that was probably one of the most intense physical challenges of my career because wow. we did it. Jay did it for real. We shipped the car from Boston to Pinewood Studios back back at Pinewood where we made the Bond film, and they have a water tank and they drop the car into the water. And if you do underwater work, you have a wonderful day where you're taught to dive. You're, 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 you're taught about, you know, the breathing mask and the, the regulator and you have the oxygen tank and it's all amazing. And then they say, well, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to take away your eyes. We're going to take away your oxygen. Um, but, you know, we're going to have everything close by. You know, so there's in the car, there will be a regulator here and a regulator here and somebody spotting you. But then the car is lowered on ropes into the water. And there's, you know, there's no act, you have to do it. So the car is going under. And as the water level gets to here, you have to take your last breath, right? And then the car goes under with you in it, in a seatbelt strapped in. So there are four sections to that sequence which requires you to, to, to hold your breath. So it's, it, it looks like it's all in one in the film, but we divided it into four, you know, and it's her struggling with this jammed seatbelt, then having to pull the seatbelt right out to kind of release herself from the seatbelt, pulling out the back headrest of the car, kicking out the back window, and you're doing all this underwater. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's wonderful to have those experiences because your body is fully going through it and fully fighting for its life, it thinks, you know. So after a few takes, you really need that dive buddy with you because to, to regulate your own heartbeat because your body thinks it's drowning. 
And um, it's those sort of extreme situations that you get to experience as an actor, which, again, stay with you. When you have a movie like that, and you film a movie like that where you know you've got a great movie on your hands and people are going to be talking about it. It's provocative, juicy performances, something you're really, really proud of. And you can't wait to show it in a theater full of people at the Toronto International Film Festival. And then the pandemic happens. Mm -hmm. What was that like? You got this great movie and you couldn't even be mm. in a theater to release it to the world. Yeah, that was pretty gutting. So I've never seen I Care A Lot in a cinema, which, um, you know, probably no, no one has. Um, I think Jay said one day we would do it and have, have a screening of it, which would be very nice. But, you know, we pivoted and they sold it to Netflix and Netflix did an amazing job of marketing it and it stayed at number one on Netflix for ages and maybe had a better reception because of that. And I think people wanted it. They wanted this sort of technicolor crime film and they wanted a bit of kind of dose of bad and inappropriateness and I, people sort of sucked it up. <laughs> we have questions oh. from the audience here. So I'm going to try to get to a few. Uh, the first one is from uh, Jonathan Moore and Abby. Question is, what is your process when working, okay, when working with someone who is hard to work with? Oh my God, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you, what's yours? Um, oh gosh. Uh, uh, um, do you, what, are you here? Where is Jonathan? Do you mean, uh, uh, Abigail? Abby, um, what, do you mean hard to work with in terms of being a bad actor or <laughs> hard to work with in terms of being an asshole or? Uh, <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I think you have to have a conversation. I think you have to face it head on. If if there's actually a feeling of a of a problem where there's a friction and you you have to you have to get in there and sort it out. You have to say I'm feeling this way. Is there anything I can do? You know, do you have is there is there something wrong? Um and we live in the age of passive aggression, of course, so you know, it can be really hard. But you, if you're going to do creative work with somebody, you you have to break through that. Um, I've worked with selfish people before and, and you know, people like the kind of actors who do one thing on your side of the take and then they give a completely different performance when the camera turns around on them, which I think is unforgivable. And it's really annoying, but there's nothing you can do about that. You just think, okay, you're just a selfish so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it, it's it's about communication. I mean, one thing as I came back to talking about Saltburn and Emerald Fennell's trust-based set, you have to have it. And however difficult the conversation is, you have to have it. Because otherwise you're just, you're, it's an uphill battle. You, you've well, just, making a movie anyway. you know, and, and um, you know, speaking your truth. So, and it also, if you know that you've done something that, that's that's sort of, upset someone or you feel that you've behaved in a way then you just have to go and make it right you have to say look on this day i i'm really sorry i don't know what it would be but i you know if i was something or if i was impatient or if i was i'm sorry it was my fault you know i you know i was a dick i you know what tyler perry says to ben affleck's character in gone girl i'm a fuck up i was a dick you know throw gummy bears at me whatever um but you have to, you have to, it doesn't work if any of that baggage is in the way. It just doesn't. Um, you have to, you have to get over it. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I've, I'm doing a quick sort of, yeah, there was a time, there was a time when, yeah, okay, here's an example. I was making United Kingdom and, um, and, um, it was, this was this was really interesting actually. We're making United Kingdom. I had felt it was a kind of emotional scene. I'd felt that I I hadn't quite got it, and we we were going to finish. And 
I suddenly had that sort of in, that that thing that drops in where you're emotionally in the right place and connected. So I said, "Let's go again. Can we go again? Let's just go now." And they. The, the first AD said, okay, set action, and we did it again. And afterwards, Amma came up to me and she said, I never, ever want anyone to do that on a set of mine. I am the director. And I just went cold. Right. And I thought, oh, my God, I had no intention of overstepping or uh, it was not my intention to take. It was, and, and I was mortified and so upset and then we had to have a conversation about that over the over the coming weeks because she, and then she had to say you know as a black woman in this industry i have had to fight so hard to have the word director on my chair and i said i completely get that and thank you for you know and so now we have a great friendship and a great trust but i overstepped in a way that i was not intentional but triggered her in all the wrong ways, and I completely owned that I'd made a mistake. So that's quite a good example, isn't it, of a it's difficult, it's, yeah. because if I hadn't done that, and I had just, you know, it was, it was such a terrible feeling, and, and obviously a terrible feeling for her too, that if we just left that, what would that have done to the film? If we just left that rift to kind of fester and open up more? Um, yeah, and then, and then actually w there was recently this thing at, back at the Royal Court where I said I mentioned that play, there was this project they did called Letter to My White Best Friend um, where a lot of artists collaborated and, and they had to write a letter that was in a sealed envelope and the, uh, the person that they'd written the letter to or, or somebody had to read the letter out and my, the, the Amma asked me to read her letter, basically. And it wasn't a letter to me, and it wasn't about that, but it was sort of about, she wrote a very clever letter, because she's a brilliant writer, about all the, about all the, the people who've kind of put her down in the course of her career. And I read it for her. So that was the kind of culmination of, of you know, that whole story and the sort of trust that developed from there and the, and the communication that came because it was difficult and we got through it. That was obviously an excellent question. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah. So next question is from Kira Grace. Uh, so uh, let's see here. Handwriting is awesome. Uh, any advice you can provide on how you stay positive in this constantly changing industry and what drives you? <sighs> oh, I don't always stay positive. <laughs> I, I can have crashing self-doubt like everybody, I think. Um, but the things that make me stay positive is, is the sort of shared sense of play and excitement and, and the feeling of just of, you know, of creating with people. Um, I've just done a tiny, tiny movie in Prague where I'm living just for three weeks and it was just two two actors but it was just you know right back to the kind of you know the two actors in a room creating something feeling it was a film but it could have also been a, a play I think I think it's that that makes me Stay positive and audiences and the fact of, you know, feeling that a conversation, you know, Saltburn is wonderful because it feels that we're, you know, that the, the, there's a point to have made it because adults are going to see it in the cinema. People are talking about it. It's making people feel things. It's pushing boundaries. And, you know, it's feeling relevant, I suppose. It's feeling relevant. And um, I also feel positive because I'm getting older in this business and I've still got work and I'm feeling I'm having a lovely time becoming the kind of mother figure, which some people worry about. And I find very stimulating and exciting to be the kind of, you know, matriarch. And I think I, I, I was inspired by Brenda Blethyn in Pride and Prejudice and how much she loved and took on that role. Oh, wow. And so in Saltburn, you know, to be the m mother figure of all these amazing younger actors was sure. really exciting. And what was the other question? Yes. Positive uh, and... Oh, yeah, what, what drives you? Oh, what drives me? 
Oh, just wanting to be better all the time, wanting to do it better, have another go, try again, try harder, fail again, fail better. That, you know. So Tatum Price, stuff. great question. Uh, you, you touched on earlier in the conversation someone when you were starting out who gave you great advice. Oh, yes. Okay. But were there just other actors? Okay. Well, the question is, uh, what was the best advice you received on set or stage by an, uh, uh, another actor, a writer, or a director? Um, mm, Judy Dench always saying, um, you must always go home at the end of the day. And she didn't mean um, necessarily physically. Like if you finish a play and you're on a high, she said, you've just got to mentally go home. You've got to make sure you know where home is always. You know, even if you're going to go out and have a party or whatever, you've just got to mentally go home because otherwise, you know, the, the adrenaline and all that can take you into sort of the wrong place. You've got to know, remember, keep remembering who, you know, who you are and where home is. So that's a small one, which I hold on to a lot. If that may, that'll either mean so, that'll either make sense to you and mean something to you and, or, or it won't. Um, I think it's a lovely one. Um, I mean, so many that Fincher said so many, he sort of said a character always knows where they're going. Um, you know, he said even people when they go into a room, they never they never actually go into a room kind of doing this kind of looking around that people often do, you know. You come into a room and you decide usually where you're going. So it's just things that, you know, he kind of, he's seen sort of tropes of acting and he tries to get you out of them. So this next question is from Scott Mance. <laughs> That's me. Uh, how do you remember your lines? Ah, I haven't got long COVID, so touch wood, that's still, they're still going in. Um, I remember them by, by, by speaking them, by, by just going over and over them. I've just, this, this film that we've just done on, on day one, well, maybe we'll talk about that one day, but on day one, we, we did one take of the entire film, which gives you some very unusual, so we had to learn it like a play, and it's a two-hander, <laughs> so... You know, that was quite a challenge. Um, but just repeating it. One of, one of the things is if you're doing a dialect and you work with a dialect coach, the great luxury is by the time you come to film, you know all the lines and you haven't even had to try and learn them because they just go in. Um, lines should be easy to learn if the writing is good. If, if usually the lines that are hard to learn is when the writing's not very good and they don't make emotional sense. And the hardest ones, of course, to learn are procedural ones. Oh, yeah. You know, where you have to give technical information that doesn't, you don't, you don't emotionally connect with. And that probably means that your character is, is being used for exposition and hasn't been properly psychologically drawn. <laughs> the play's the thing. You know. The play's the thing. Next question is from uh, Fund Me. Uh, what is the most important aspect of a role that you look for when choosing your projects. Gosh, my water. I'm going to start on yours in a minute. Um, the the what the what? Uh, the most. Uh, uh, I'm going to read that again. Uh, what is the most important aspect in a role that you look for when choosing your projects? Are they fun to watch? Do I care about them? Um, do I have a secret about them? Have I seen this character before? Can I do? Can I do something original with this, or could somebody else do it better? Um, you know, uh, yes, do I, do I have a secret about them is usually the one. That's usually my touchstone. Um, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's do I have a secret? Last question, bringing it back to Saltburn. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Haley Rose. What was your process when basically creating your character for your performance? not just what was written in Salper. Um, with Elspeth Catton, she, I had to give her a backstory. I had to think, you know, how she came to be married to Sir James. You know, what was her youth like? You know, what are her disappointments? I think her disappointments are many. You know, I think she, you know, she talks about having been a model. I think she was not a very successful model. 
you know, I think she was a sort of socialite hanging out in New York, you know, not really, probably not being very sensible or being very healthy. And, so, you know, she was introduced to this older man and decided that, you know, she could be looked after and that might look, that might look quite comfortable and quite nice. Um, Emerald talked a lot about sex because I think sort of, you know, she feels that sort of sex underpins most of Saltburn, obsession, desire, you know, wanting it, not getting it, you know, needing it, desiring it. Um, and then she said to me, well, I don't think Sir James and Elspeth have sex, do you? And I said, oh, well, I'd assumed, I'd assumed they did. I, I mean, I hadn't really thought about it, but I'd assumed they did. She said, oh, no, 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 I don't think they do. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I've got to make sense of that for myself. So I started doing some research into why, you know, why a couple might not have sex. And I discovered that you can be a sexual anorexic um, and that sexual anorexia exists as much as, as the anorexia that we're all, you know, um, familiar with. And if, if for the anorexic, the food anorexic might say, you know, food is my greatest need and also my greatest fear, the sexual anorexic would say sex is my greatest need and also my greatest fear. And that gave me a, a very interesting way to play Elspeth because you, it's your greatest need. You want to be desired. You want people to look at you sexually. You want, but it's also something you loathe. And I think Saltburn is a film about loving and loathing and the way that obsession is a kind of, it, it walks that line between, between loving and loathing. Um, and so for Elspeth, a lot of her b being, a lot of her, a lot of her character is about deflecting from any real emotion, real feeling. Um, so that was, that was an interesting part of the process. And then the other thing was just ordering a lot of Vogues from 2006 and seven and sort oh, of, yeah. you know, idly looking through the pages, being envious of all the adverts that didn't include myself in or didn't include Elspeth in um and the fun thing was improvising as Elspeth because I basically had to take any story that was um of the time and sort of insert myself into it it was the time that Keith Richards was reported to have snorted his father's ashes <laughs> oh, geez, um, yeah, yeah. and I and I thought that was a kind of marvelous story for Elspeth to have got on and she could have said oh god you know when I was in Mystique and you know <laughs> Keith came to me and offered me a line of his father's ashes <laughs> and you know I mean I just <laughs> you know she was so fun to improvise because you just had to make you had to take the most self-centered position of any, on any story that was in the public eye. Karl Lagerfeld going on his diet. Well, Karl came to me, obviously, because I've always been naturally thin. Um, <laughs> you know, it was the time. So she was, so there was just, it was just imagining, imagining, imagining. You know, there's been obviously characters with more research, but this was research of the imagination, really. So, so Saltburn, I mean, it's it's right there. It's on Prime. I mean, you've got to see this movie and see it again because, I mean, I've seen it three times already, and you definitely get something out of it each time you see it. It is a wildly entertaining and outrageously entertaining film. And so so with Rosamond, like the last like five times I interviewed you, it was on Zoom. And I was like, when do I get to do the in-person conversation? And now here I got to do a career conversation. Rosamund Pike, I have to say, this has been an so absolute pleasure, you. an absolute joy. Thank you so much for being here at the Thanks Foundation. Thanks, everyone, for being here.